Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have to stress one point. It was the other administration at the White House. It certainly wasn't <laughs> the, the, the present one. Um, so uh, I have one issue, which is that I have about 30 minutes of content. I'm trying to cram into 10 minutes. So I'm going to go as fast as I can. What's grateful is everything these guys said is so aligned to the thoughts. So I think I can cheat a little bit. Um, I don't know what to click it, by the way. <laughs> is oh, just <laughs> I run a tech company, but I don't know how to do buttons. <laughs> okay. ah, thank you. Okay, so a um, quick summary of what I'm talking about. There's a strong theme of diversity and inclusion in this, but really um, what I'm interested in really getting across is a wider spectrum of what's happening at work, what's happening with us, both on a technological uh, front, but also thinking about the psych psychology, so people. And I think understanding those two worlds is, is a fascinating item. So really, do we want to be sat on by the change or do we want to design the change we want to be part of? Um, so a couple of very big stats, which I think we probably touched on in the recent talks. One is by 2020, there's going to be 2.1 billion professionals around the world. What's fascinating with that, of course, is we all know well about 50 to 150, and that's it. Our LinkedIn accounts probably scream about 500 to 1,000 people, but there's nearly about 2.1 billion professionals out there that we don't know. We're not connected to. There's nothing right now today that has brought that all together, which is kind of a crazy thing because what we're dealing with is supply chains in a very, very interesting new way. So what an amazing opportunity to think about. Another interesting stat which paints a picture is this. So we've got about, uh, by 2020, 50 billion connected devices. So that's great, but what's really interesting is this. By 2030, you've got a trillion. So if you think about the internet revolution about the last 30 or 35 years, um, this pokes at a stat which is we're about 1% along the way. So all this crazy change we've looked at, 3D printing and so on, we're 1%. So what happens now is incredible, it's frightening, it's scary. More of that in a moment. But really the fact is that if we look at the businesses, um, the latest thinking is over the next 10 years, nearly half of all Fortune 500 firms will be out of business. And that's because they're not geared up in any way, in any way, to think about exponential change. So again, more of that in a moment. So a quick snapshot of what's been going on, thinking HR, thinking people, thinking businesses. Really what we've done is we've been on a very fast uh, journey to the point where we're now a on-demand business entity <coughs> thing. Um, it's about how we think about the fluid workforce. So to give you a flavor of this, think about KPMG, for example. You have around 200,000 people in a fixed best part of the business which is fascinating, but it's also woefully inefficient. Every company is in that state. When you get over sort of 50 people, you start to become unbelievably inefficient. Um, nobody knows anybody. The knowledge that sits there, the brooming incredible insights is completely wasted. Um, but what they have right now is a contingent workforce of about 20,000 people. So when you start to think about this, in addition to the fact that they have an alumni network that's on a newsletter, and I'm not citing them as a bad example, they are a very traditional example of this, is what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next is essentially a flip. Uh, we predict that in the next five years to six years, what you'll find is about 200,000 will be in their, uh, their liquid talent pool, as Accenture call it, their fluid workforce, and 20,000 will be their fixed business. And that's a very interesting shift, partly for the organization, but much more importantly for all of us. Because our world that we're knowing, a number of people I've met today, um, are all living in this new territory, which is basically your life, your world, your portfolio career. And that's a very wonderful place to find ourselves. Um, when we think about large organizations, what's really interesting is essentially a cheat sheet. It's all there. What has been and what will be, it's pretty damn obvious. If you scan into it, any aspect is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And I find it phenomenal that large organizations are fumbling in the dark, essentially, thinking, well, it's, I mean, look at this. Do you want to have annual appraisals that have never worked? Or think about real-time feedback. Like, do you want to you know, reward managers for hoarding information or sharing information? The list goes on and on. There's about 50 to 60 absolute no-brainers if we map those out. There's a blueprint for a company for the next 20 years. Um, but if, you, if you, any of you guys work in large firms, ask, ask around, have a look at whether we, um, we are really fulfilling that. Um, again, I'm trying to whiz through it super, super light speed, so bear with me. Um, AI machine learning, spoken about a lot. Everybody knows this basic premise that essentially um, the domain for people with repetitive jobs is probably going to go to the automation area. Uh, which might be up to 40-50% by 2050. So it's a big deal, we get that. Um, but the domain, to Heather's point, that's going to remain supreme for us uh, humans for at least a long time is creativity and insight. And I'll be talking about that in a moment, about leadership, but what I think is missing, woefully missing for most aspects of all leadership is around creativity um, and an interest in humanity. It's a very interesting point you made earlier. Um, but thinking about machine learning and AI and th thinking about businesses becoming more agile, um, what I find fascinating is they've done a lot of work around codifying explicit data sources. So CVs, of course, LinkedIn is beginning to be codified. Where the real magic is tacit. 
those feelings and emotions around people and what they mean. That stuff is uncodifiable or has been recently, but we're starting to go into that space. And a number that I thought was really interesting is uh, take HSBC, just an example. Every day, there's about 21 billion data points that take place in that organization. So people clicking buttons, saying things, not saying things, it all means something. And it's a chance for us to start to codify that in, a, in an amazing way. So HSBC right now today doesn't even know how many staff it's got. They spend a billion dollars a year on consultants who leave very quickly after certain projects. So they've got corporate dementia. This is not unusual for HSBC, it's many firms. The point is, what an amazing opportunity to reinvent the collection of knowledge of firms. Um, magic number, 28. That was a magic number. Um, so this is a number that we did after like, analyzing the market over about sort of 5,000 people across multiple industries. And the number 28 is really referring to the number of times all of us need to find someone or something every day. Okay? Now the magic part of this, well, the other part, it's a very magical number. The magic part of this is around, it's not actually within your tribe you're looking for. If we were all collectively in HR and a big business, um, we don't need to have a tool that solves that because we can kind of talk to each other. Enough, enough, well-ish. This is about reaching out to people outside your tribe, your department, your function. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at the workplace, if you look at what's going on, everyone's invested in essentially one type of technology, one type of solution, and it's a how solution. So email, IM systems, timesheets, LinkedIn, most things with acronyms are how solutions. Um, fine, but if our business is about people, it's about insight and knowledge, where's the who engine? Where's that thing that understands what we're good at and most importantly what we're interested in? Where's that engine? So, as you can probably guess, I'm slightly plugging what we do here, but the point is um, there is a desperate need for a who engine because think chronologically, whether you agree with me or not that it's the most important thing, the truth is it comes first. You don't want to send an email out to a thousand people going, hey, does anybody know? What you want to do is immediately understand the seven rock stars, the seven people that have that incredible domain expertise, the 15 that would like to get into that space to think about aspirational skills. Which then leads to another question, which is humans. And I'll talk about this in a moment, but basically there's about 74% of people that aren't great at collaborating, so we have to motivate, and we'll, we'll go into that in a moment. <coughs> but what's really important about this is we hear a lot about diversity and inclusion. This is incredibly important. We get it. In fact, I think EY did a report recently to show that a diverse team was far more profitable as well. So there's lots of stats coming out of the market for this. The problem is, if we're having an honest conversation, every single one of us suffers from homophily which is the subconscious bias, the unconscious bias for like-mindedness. So if we recognize, if we have an honest conversation about this, we have to start to leverage tech to think about decision processes. So if you, you may not know this, but in every, every large firm, there's huge functions set up to sort of put resources of teams together, bids together every single day, done by people that can't see the breadth of talent and the interests around the organization. Isn't this kind of nuts? We're using Excel to make decisions, and then we rely on the humans to make sort of poor decisions. So it's just an interesting perspective to think in the adventure of finding out the right who, let's leverage algorithms. You may not know this, but in the legal sector, they're starting to explore things <coughs> like blind, uh, blind allocation. That's the notion of removing names and even pictures of who you are. We're just interested, the machine just interested in understanding the right blend of skills and competencies and interests and attributes first. So that's a really interesting way to start to really tackle and move the dial on diversity and inclusion in my humble opinion. Then you obviously have the why and then you push this new node of optimized people, the right blend of people into the how system that is prolific across most firms. Um, lovely quote from uh, uh, Ginny here, Johnny Romanty. So really it's about what you share. So a quick touch knowing that I'm really dragging on my time now is three interesting buckets when you think about organizations. The first is the intellect, the second is the network and the, sec and the third is about attitude. Um, this isn't bulletproof, but I think this is a quite an interesting formula. So we've been hiring people because they've got 7,000 PhDs and they're incredibly smart, great. And you're hiring her because she's got an amazing network, and then so on and so on. The, the truth is, your individual IQ points matter far less than the collective IQ points. And this is the same with your network. What's the point of having the world's best book if you're not going to share it? And the same with attitude. So what we're really striving for is a multiplier, not a linear effect. And the idea here is a collective view of all this stuff. And what has happened historically is the horrible tech that we've had at work, because it's really, really archaic compared to the shazams of this world that you have in your pocket. Um, we need to multiply this and accelerate this by the technology that we desperately need at work uh, that we have in our normal life. So, leads me very quickly, I'm trying to speed up to attitude. So, uh, 
favorite picture. Um, so back to my friend Dave Logan that we mentioned. So he's did a survey across three and a half million people. Um, this really is important because really what you have now is a view, it's just a view, a view that are five levels of attitude. And what you have here, I've done the maths, uh, took me a while. So you've got approximately 74% of a typical organization, it is worse in different industries, and I won't share which ones, but you can probably guess, in terms of wanting and needing and feeling that urge to collaborate. The fourth level is what you call triadic. It's that, I call it connecting Tourette's. You just can't help yourself. Faye is guilty as any of having connecting Tourette's. Mm -hmm. um, let's call her out as it is. Um, the truth here, which is a wonderful quality, the world goes around because of this quality. But if we're having an honest conversation with moving the dial on innovation and medicine, whatever you want to call it, um, putting networks together for climate change, we're going to have to think about moving the dial on attitude. So if we can think about reward mechanics, <coughs> motivation techniques, etc. Uh, we have to think about applying that to that 74%. The good news is the phase of this world can't help themselves. You don't have to give them anything. They just, they totally love this uh, connectivity play. Um, quickly, quickly, currency of trust. You can argue that eBay, Amazon and so on, the reason they've worked, it was unlocked, is because we gave feedback. Um, brilliant example is really TripAdvisor. Um, and the question is, where's TripAdvisor at work? So if we think about the workforce of the future, uh, we are increasingly dealing and working with more people in a faster way than we've ever done before. And we are human. We're not built to know more than 150 people-ish. We're just not designed to that, but the world is not like in the rhythm of how we've been designed. So therefore, we have to think about the currency of trust. We have to invest in a way to unlock um, the notion of why am I going to collaborate with this person. Not because they're relevant, because I think they're the best person for the job. So businesses need to start to invest in this process soon. Change. We have a bit of a funny one with us humans again, which is we have, uh, we're basically, a, again, I don't know if you guys know this, but essentially seven times, four to seven times more uh, great design to think about fear and worry. It's why, and even though we have um, expertise from the sort of news environment, news is always pretty much negative. And it's catering to that part of your brain, that gland in the brain that's just thinking about this worry. The, the, rec the recognition is critical because if we're gonna think about change programs for large organizations, we have to understand that people first go, well, what about me? How's it going to affect me? So if we get onto this topic, we can start to think and move people thinking not about fear anymore, but about reward. And that's a very, very interesting part. I'm nearly there. <laughs> this represents two things. Stop buying management technology for large organizations and then question why no one's using it. That's madness. And the second thing is, unfortunately, most leaders have come from a sort of um, a time, if you like, but, um, and it's not an age comment, it's an attitudinal thing, um, which is they're, they're not really wanting to change or recognize change or part of it because they're not even incentivized. You have very, very few people that are incentivized to take big risks. So you think about the CI community, you think about the um, risk environment in big banks, for example. No one is incentivized to take interesting risks. They're all paid to say no to things. And then we worry about innovation. Um, quick, nearly there. <laughs> the world, I do. You said that for <laughs> In my head, it's, I haven't said it yet. I'm, I, I'm saving that for one more. Uh, so, Essentially, again, thinking about how we came out of the savannah, we are built and designed to think in a linear and a, and a, and a localised basis. It thinks about how we work. The world is now exponential and global. So again, back to this point about um, uh, how we are operating in a much wider pool of people than ever before, but we're not really geared up to do that. Um, it's the same with organisations, because they are an embodiment of who we are. And now we have companies that are accelerating and different. Now, the truth is this. There's a reason why we have 40% of all the Fortune 500 are going to be dead. It's because these large organizations simply are not geared up to do change and deal with it. They're talking about being the agile firm, but they're not going to do it. So the only way forward, in my humble opinion, is you have to think about um, partnering with innovative, agile companies. And what's great is the beginnings of how you're seeing, for example, with O2, Telefonica, how they are obviously investing in exciting ideas and bringing them back into the fold because they're not gonna do it themselves. Um, SAP recently have launched SAP IO, which in itself is an incubator to start bringing companies into the business. So there's tons of this happening and you'll see more and more a wider proliferation of, it, of funds on the side of businesses like Wells Fargo and so on that are trying to reinvent their own businesses. Um, career point two O. I really am nearly there. This is the penultimate science slide. Um, what this all means for all of us is a great thing. We start to think about our new career. We think about ourselves just not just as worker bees, but we're humans. We've got interests and hobbies, and we want to travel, and we want to do all these things. And we can start to do this now, because as we're seeing with lots of big companies, is it's okay, and it's actually important now, to work across multiple businesses, because you get an experience that, whether my father, God bless him, he's been an amazing lawyer for most of his life, um, he, uh, he had one job. And I've had five, I've been five four times, which I'm quite proud of now. Uh, but what a different world that we're living in. Um, and then uh, I think a summary of all this is, do we want to be sort of bubble boy 
um, or do we want to be sort of this, this crazy hero? And so I was trying to sort of summarize things, and I think the top piece is about leadership. Leadership needs to either get out of the room <coughs> and get replaced, or step up and be brave. Um, we have to be brave with AI machine learning. It's there to help. Um, if you read every company's brochureware, every single one talks about diversity and inclusion. They talk about employee centricity. But actually, if you, if you look under uh, the covers on this, there's an awful lot lack, lacking in the businesses. So employee centricity is a true endeavor they need to get into. The currency of trust needs to be invested in. And understanding the borderless workforce is a good place to be to find yourself. Accenture, KPMG and Deloitte, all these firms are actually moving into this space, which is a very exciting thing. Aligning win conditions. So the notion is simple, right? You align the win conditions of the organization, i.e. the culture and where you're trying to get to. You align that with the department, you align that with the individual. There is alignment there, you just have to figure it out. And then when you've aligned it, good things happen.